Uh, yes, I'd like to thank the Juno Economic Development Council and the sponsors for this opportunity. I'm coming to you from Aquan Territory and Clinket Ani. We set out to address two issues and found one solution. The first issue was to create a local source for building materials that are more durable for use in our rainforest climate, materials that do not contribute to climate change. The second issue we wanted to address is the toxic waste products left over from many mining operations that may require expensive maintenance forever to protect our fisheries and other values we hold dear in Southeast Alaska. And I'm not sure why my slides aren't advancing. You can try clicking with your mouse. It might work if the keyboard isn't. Oh, yeah, then it went too many. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. As you look around the region, you'll see that cement and concrete are very common building materials for a variety of reasons. Uh, cement is very versatile. It can be preformed into products such as bridge spans or poured in place for uses such as foundations or sidewalks. What we commonly refer to as cement is actually a very specific product uh, invented in 1824 called ordinary Portland cement. This type of cement is uh, become the industry standard even though it has several drawbacks. Various cements existed prior to 1824 and Jonathan will describe some of these in a minute. But many of these were much more durable and stronger than the ordinary Portland cement that we use today. Almost all of the Portland cement that's used in the Pacific Northwest and Alaska is imported, primarily from South Korea and some from Canada. Alaska has one large offloading facility in Anchorage, where the cement then must be loaded onto smaller barges or railroad cars or trucks, and then transported to the site where it'll be mixed with aggregates and water to be used. Um, in 2017, it was estimated that Alaska had a deficit in the availability of Portland cement. The production of Portland cement contributes eight to around 8% of all the global greenhouse gas emissions. Our solution was to use local mine tailings already ground up and available to create a better cement product. These products go by the general name of geopolymer, even though they vary as widely as the materials that they're made from. One of the great attributes of this technology is that it chemically binds and encapsulates the toxins in the tailings into a non-leachable form that prevents them from spreading into the environment. Here we conducted the standard leaching test on uh, the raw mining, the raw tailings from the mine that's on the left. And then we converted it in a separate sample of the tailings into a geopolymer, then crushed the geopolymer and ran the leachate test again. As you can see on the right, no lead was reproduced in the leachate solution. Jonathan? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, so basically, geopolymer is a word coined in the late 70s by Dr. Davidovitz in France to describe a polysilate. Uh, more accurately, uh, in history, it has been an alkali activated alumina silica. And this is uh, actually one of the ways nature makes rocks. Um, I operate in the realm of many types of binders, not just what are called geopolymers. Um, chemically bonded phosphate ceramics have been in cultures going back as far as Oh, 12,000 or yeah, 12,000 years. Uh, Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, for instance, the Delhi Tower is a phosphate based cement. Um, megaliths in South America, 
um, are are not Portland cement, obviously. Uh, the first load of Portland cement came to America in 1875. The Erie Canal was built in 1832. Fort Sumter, um, many concrete structures, even the Brooklyn Bridge are not Portland cement. So the longevity has been proven. The technology is being rediscovered and um, made more standardized. We do have a geopolymer standard now in the United States, in Australia, India, Italy, um, and for instance, the Brisbane Airport, 40,000 meters cubed of geopolymer, not one ounce of Portland cement. It is viable and anyone looking at it won't have to be worried about being the first. They won't even be the one million. And as Guy pointed out, it has the unique ability to convert toxins and heavy metals into non-leaching formats. So I, I don't have a stopwatch, but basically this graph shows a direct comparison between um, ordinary Portland cement and geopolymers. And uh, maybe you can do a screenshot and study that, but the, um, the strength is another issue. Um, generally, Portland cement gets 85% of its design strength in 28 days. The strengths that I'm getting are one day strengths. So um, when I submitted a test for the uh, mine tailings uh, on Admiralty Island, that test was done before the sample was even one day old. And um, that's a, a very helpful attribute. So yeah, there we go. I think I, you're Okay, so any color you want, as long as it's black, which is a joke, it actually, I can mute those, uh, those colors some with uh, other minerals. Um, they are very chemically um, tolerant. We can uh, withstand the full range of the pH scale nearly, whereas Portland cement is uh, somewhat sensitive to the pH in its final rendition. And um, there are places in the world, Central Australia for one, where Portland cement just simply isn't allowed due to sulfate uh, soils. And that would be absolutely no issue with the right binder. So we can do everything you can do with Portland cement, but we can do a thousand things that cannot be done with Portland cement. Um, hey, Don? Well, yeah, I'd, I'd like to make a comparison of the two uh, from an engineering viewpoint. Uh, I especially like the idea that you could strip forms in them um, in like one day uh, in for uh, for port regular Portland cement, but you could do it in three hours with a, with a uh, copolymer. Um, and I also like the idea for Arctic conditions here where the um, geopolymers don't uh, absorb water and it's especially good for uh, um, for um, uh, freeze-thaw techniques. Uh, <clears throat> and it doesn't shrink while it's drying. Um, and, and one thing, um, Jonathan didn't mention this, one of the high points I think is the curing time for a geopolymer is like three days instead of 28 days. And uh, that's a big thing for construction you could do. Uh, many things much faster using the geopolymer. Um, we're going to have mining around for a long time while we're hunting for uh, minerals for uh, batteries and solar panels. And, um, and so there's going to be solid waste, uh, I mean, uh, uh, these wastes around, and we're going to have to deal with them for a long time. And using geopolymers is a, uh, is a good way to, to do them. One of the, the benefits for using these geopolymers 
especially in Alaska, is its local jobs and local materials. Um, the production is a superior product <clears throat> without producing greenhouse gases. It solves a lot of the problems for the mine that it might otherwise require treatment forever. And we could go to a, um, a zero waste level um, with mine tailings. The, um, uh, they, these tailings can be packaged you know, in bags, just like regular cement or transported in bulk. Uh, uh, <clears throat> most of the research uh, or more research needs to be done. And we need to look at the economic conditions for marketing and export. Uh, and we must overcome the inertia of doing a little bit of uh, doing a, a, some things the same way in the sa as we've been doing in the past. And uh, we'll probably need some technical training and upgrading of uh, a tradesman, but we can do that through demonstrations and other things. Um, um, I, uh, I think if you'd like to have more information, uh, please go to www.friendsofadmiralty.org and there'll be more there. Thank you. So we're going to be hearing from Margie Doshevsky and Donovan Rusinello of the Fairbanks Climate Action Coalition on breaking up with your mega bank. So go ahead and jump right in, guys. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Margie Doshevsky. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Regenerative Economies Coordinator for the Fairbanks Climate Action Coalition calling in today from Denaina Lands. And uh, yeah, this is like the grand finale, last short of the summit. Um, excited to be here. We're talking about um, the value of keeping money in communities over the course of the last three days. And um, that's absolutely what we're um, looking to do with the Fairbanks Climate Action Coalition's um, campaign to bank locally. So um, have really enjoyed hearing from the various keynote speakers um, and have gotten a lot of ideas and inspiration about how to really cycle money uh, within our communities um, so that we compound and share that value and grow that value um, instead of having it leave Alaska. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to my um, co-presenter, Donovan Rossinello, to uh, introduce himself as well. Thanks, Margie. Yep, my name is Donovan. I'm the finance intern with the Fairbanks Climate Action Coalition. Use he, him pronouns, and I'm calling in from Denaina Lands here uh, in Anchorage, Alaska. And yeah, just super excited to present about not only our campaign and how it's grown so far, but how more folks can get involved and how we envision it growing in the future. So pass it back to Margie to get, get rolling. Yeah, so the Fairbanks Climate Action Coalition has been around for six years. Uh, we're a volunteer driven grassroots organization and um, specifically focused on interior Alaska, but increasingly connected to uh, statewide work with the uh, recently formed Alaska Climate Alliance and the Just Transition Collective. Um, and so we are community organizers who are working to mitigate and adapt to climate change and elevate solutions that foster a fair, equitable, and just transition to sustainable communities. And as the Regenerative Economies Coordinator, I'm specifically looking at how can we build the, yeah, the economic infrastructure and tools and capacities um, to, to realize a lot of the visions that have been shared uh, so far. And we've got a great group of volunteers doing that. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about how we're, um, how we're getting, getting from A to B, but first also just wanna recognize that we also have four other working groups as well. The Interfaith Working Group, the Renewable Energy Working Group, um, the Keep It in the Ground Working Group, uh, and, um, the policy and politics working group. So um, lots of grassroots organizing. Um, so where are we? We're, Alaska is uh, in many senses a resource colony. Wealth is extracted and talent leaves the state. And how can we, instead of having that um, flight of capital, uh, really reinvest profits back into Alaska and keep the best and brightest minds here um, so that our state can be stronger. So we've got a bold, ambitious vision, and I think it's shared by a lot of folks here about what it, what it would look like to thrive in Alaska for the generations to come. And we 
are trying to build an economy that works for everyone, that is diverse, resilient. Um, we've learned so much from the pandemic. We know that we're already facing this climate crisis. And by increasing our self-sufficiency, we can really, um, yeah, weather, weather these, um, these challenges as they come. So applying the lessons that we're learning and um, really investing in place-based local businesses and innovation uh, informed by the indigenous economies that are still here, um, that are very much part of the fabric of living in Alaska. So uh, a lot of times we'll talk about remembering forward and how we can um, really weave in the wisdom um, of that place-based knowledge. And there's a ton of opportunity. I've passed the Donovan. Yeah, and so we really did start with that vision. And the beautiful thing is there's a lot of really awesome ideas already here for uh, businesses that are aligned with our values, our vision for a regenerative economy here in the future of Alaska. The unfortunate reality, as Margie mentioned, though, is that uh, a lot of resources are being extracted from our state at the moment, not only financial resources through the mega banks, which I'll touch a little bit more on in a second, but also, yeah, the human capital and just uh, the the intellectual resources here in the state as well. A lot of younger folks are seeing opportunities in lower 48 that aren't available up here. And so we tried to ask the question of why that is and how we can empower the people who have those awesome ideas and share our vision and uh, have a way of doing it through business and entrepreneurship. How can we empower them to realize that future and start to build um, that thriving economy here and retain a lot of the resources that have been extracted. And so uh, we started by just, uh, and we're still, it's a work in progress, but building um, a local business inventory, basically just a spreadsheet of, like I said, those entrepreneurs and businesses that are either you know getting started or have been built already that are aligned with those values. And then started to try and think of ways that we could help empower them, support them and allow them to grow. And so what we landed on was, you know, those, those financial resources are key for them, not only to, to grow, but to expand and, and bring others uh, their way as well. And so, um, it's been touched on a lot over the past three days, but local banks and credit unions do a great job of retaining resources in our communities and then investing them in a way that allows for that sustainable growth. I know the statistic was thrown around yesterday in the keynote that um, for each dollar that is invested or deposited in a local bank or credit union as three times more likely to be invested in the community. There's a lot of virtuous cycles that come from keeping those deposits here at home. And so uh, our big campaign right now, our big ask of folks is to consider uh, you know, drawing down their deposits at the mega banks and uh, depositing it in local banks instead. So that's where we started. We started with that idea of local entrepreneurs and businesses and how we could support them. We've now started reaching out to potential partners in those federal credit in those credit unions or or local banks, and we're starting to see that they have needs and perceived gaps. Um, along the way towards that ideal future as well. And so we've started to broaden it a bit. So we've got the campaign and the beauty of you know, individuals depositing with local banks and credit unions. And now we have a, a view of those perceived needs. For example, we talked to a credit union who has a lot of liquidity right now. And what they need is support in reaching out to folks, marketing their, their loans and finding partners that they could offer those loans to. So not only you know, provide for their, for their members, but allow for the, for the empowerment of those businesses as well. So just kind of bridging that gap. And one other group of stakeholders that we've been thinking about a lot re recently and started to reach out to um, is investors and business professionals. So a beauty of the credit union model and just local banks in general is not only the how um, they're accountable to our local communities and uh, community members, but also how they, through those connections, provide technical assistance as well, maybe support in building a business plan or you know, thinking through how you might scale your operations as they start to craft a loan for you. But because, for example, credit unions are beholden to their members in so much as they have to provide a certain level of return, they're not allowed to you know, speculatively invest or offer certain support that uh, could be risky for lack of a better term. And so um, that's why we're starting also to think about how we can start to reach out to investors and these business leaders so that we can kind of close that loop, have the three groups of stakeholders working together in a way that paves the way for that better, more regenerative economy here locally, keeps those resources here, allows for the virtuous cycle of supporting each other and reaping rewards together, as opposed to, you know, extracting those those resources and allocating them somewhere else. And so to, to sum it all up, I know I, I, I throw a lot of words around, but we've got a really awesome campaign going already. 
Um, I think I've got the link handy here. So I'm just gonna drop it in the chat really quickly, but we've got uh, a pledge for folks to, to um, just pledge to, yeah, draw down their deposits at megabanks and start to deposit them more locally. That goes a long way. I don't have to hammer the point home too much more. It goes a long way towards supporting your local communities, business owners and entrepreneurs. And then the way that we see FCAC's role moving forward, not only catalyzing that, but bridging those gaps, um, you know, providing a space for these types of conversations, connections, and networking between the three stakeholder groups so that we can build that virtuous cycle, the, the, uh, the circle between the three, and identify the perceived gaps and opportunities for everybody to work together for a more uh, regenerative economy and thriving communities here in Alaska. And rolling with that metaphor of our slide photos, closing the nutrient cycle, closing the loop here, keeping these um, rewards, uh, reaping rewards for future generations as well. So uh, we really want to invite you all to be part of building that and growing that. Uh, so we hope that you will reach out to us uh, and connect. Uh, we have a whole bunch of links that you can access. Um, and maybe Donovan, you can drop that link in the chat as well. Um, and feel free to contact me via email, uh, really identifying, yeah, that basic needs assessment. What are the gaps? How can we help do some of that networking? And really looking forward to, yeah, hosting some potluck dinners between entrepreneurs and um, investors in post-pandemic times, knock on wood. But um, excited to be in community uh, with you all and look forward to uh, seeing what we can build together. Great, thank you so much guys. And that does it for the innovation shorts for this year's innovation summit. What a great way to end the short session. So thank you so much. Um, we have five minutes left for questions. So uh, if you're in the audience and you have a question, please go ahead and drop it in the chat. Um, we already have one question that got dropped a little while ago for Guy. So I'll just read that out to you Guy and then you feel free to unmute yourself and answer if you'd like. So the question comes from John Neary and he asks, Guy, what do you suppose is the first step to bringing geopolymer cement to market in Southeast Alaska? Um, turn my camera back on. Uh, yeah, I think uh, first of all, it's working with the mining company themselves. There's a lot of applications for this within the mining industry you know, uh, as cement for backfill and or a quick setting grout to prevent groundwater intrusion into the underground tunnels. I think once they get used to dealing with it, um, it can be introduced everywhere. The process is no different than ordinary Portland cement, doesn't require any special equipment. It's basically the same as any other project. If the economics figure out, um, then it's very doable. Um, it's just uh, overcoming that initial inertia of doing the same thing the same way all the time. I think that's the, the biggest hurdle. Great, thanks for that answer, Guy. Um, so we have another question in the chat. Um, so from John Sisk, he says, thank you, Margie, Donovan, Jennifer, Don, Jonathan, and Guy. Lots to think about and do. Where does True North Federal Credit Union fit in? I think that's a question for our last presenters. Yeah, and not being in the region, I'll also open it up to other folks. Um, I just looked at the website and um, got a general sense of um, your local credit union in Juneau. So I think that um, probably a counterpart to some of the credit unions were um, uh, connecting with in Fairbanks. Um, and it's, yeah, I think it's, 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 like the keynote speaker said yesterday, it's one piece of the puzzle. And so being able to, um, as we say, break up with your mega bank, invest in your local bank, um, definitely check out um, True North Federal Credit Union. Thanks for bringing it up. And also um, excited to um, amplify the great work that Spruce Root is doing as well. It's a local um, CDFI in Southeast. Yeah, and I guess maybe just to, add as well, uh, not so familiar as Margie said, because we've been really focusing on Fairbanks, but did a quick look as well. They look really great, Spruce Root as well. But yeah, I, I would hammer home the point that it's a part a part of the puzzle. And hopefully that's a big takeaway of what I was rambling on about during our presentation is not only 
the local banks and credit unions, but folks who would deposit there, um, members who could maybe reach out and see what the, the needs are of those financial institutions, but then also um, the folks who could maybe invest, have funds to invest or have business experience to offer those to local entrepreneurs as well. So it's just kind of a holistic, like the financial capital, but also the intellectual capital and just the community support that um, comes together for that better, better, more regenerative future.